Okay, thank you. I would like to thank the uh, organizer and uh, uh, that invite me for, th for this uh, conference. Um, I'm not a computer science. I'm going to give you uh, a lot of things that uh, I'm doing in my clinical job working with people that do AI. Uh, and uh, the stuff that I understood from the techniques part that seems to me important um, by intuition most of the time. Um, and uh, just starting by um, a few history. Um, in 2016, at the end of 2016, there have been this paper in JAMA uh, published by a group which is uh, a spin-off, not a spin-off, which is a joint venture from uh, Google, um, about the diagnostic uh, of the uh, diabetic retinopathy automatically with uh, uh, AI tools, deep learning algorithm. This paper was put, JAMA is a very strong internal medicine journal. It's uh, just like 38 in part factor or something like that. And the uh, editorial was published on the same day, explained that uh, this paper had a lot of limitation. Uh, the reproducibility will never prove. Uh, and uh, more than that, the applicability and the regulatory approval will be a mess because the population were not well selected, and so and so. And 18 months later, uh, the FDA approved, and that was the first uh, AI deep learning algorithm approved on the class three, like we discussed previously, uh, type uh, diagnostic tools. Eight, 18 months is so fast I in this field. And um, of course, there is some limitation on the applicability. Uh, it's for a specific case, a specific population. But these tools now is considered as a gold standard because in a large population, it has been proven that it's better than the normal basic ophthalmologist in US. One point, recently, there is a lawsuit on that coming because this system mass missed uh, a melanoma of the retina. And the system was uh, in in used in the case, the ca use case was for the screening of retinopathy and the case missed completely a very severe malignant cancer of the uh, eyes uh, that was diagnosed six months later and was missed by the system because it was not designed for that. And I think this case represented all the challenge we have. We're gonna be able to design very, very dedicated and very specific tools, but not generic tools with the same capability of adaptability than human. And both are necessary. Just we need to understand the limitation of each. Sometimes these tools will be better than physician. In some other circumstances, they will be very, very dangerous too. And the validation of these tools will be the most part of all uh, this process. R very recently, the same group published another paper about using this uh, OCT, just ophthalmologic view, they are able to predict not only the age of the patient, which is quite easy because they know it, or at least you're supposed to know it, but the vascular risk to anticipate the risk of stroke and cardiac infarct. And there is another paper, I, I didn't put it here because it, has been publi it was published last week, that say we can potentially anticipate the risk of Alzheimer just from the uh, view of the retina. I don't know if it's true, but it gives you a vision of when we are dealing with large population, large sample, this kind of uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithm are very, very uh, powerful. You all know that, I'm gonna pass. That was a big, big challenge and, and a big impact uh, for, for the AI community, especially in China, 
And, and in China, the, um, the, when AlphaGo won uh, over the, the world champion, uh, which was from South Korea, uh, the, the government and the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, decide to put billions of dollars on AI. They say, if they want to go, we need to be part of this game. And they put million dollars or more on what they have put already on 2017 after uh, this uh, event. I think it's quite important also to see the map, um, the map of what's happened in the world in, uh, in, this, uh, in this game. Uh, of course, the America and the West Coast, uh, and uh, uh, this is where a lot of things happen, but the China too now, a and the China, uh, especially in the field of healthcare, uh, but also in cybersecurity, on, on, on crime protection, they don't have so much issue in privacy, which is quite helpful uh, to manage large data sets. Uh, like I said previously, uh, in China, the data do, uh, are the owner of the data are the hospital, and not the patient, uh, which is in the world, one of the rare countries in the world like that. Um, the other country, and we're going to speak a little bit about Canada, uh, the England and UK was very strong from the beginning. And just to remind you that DeepMind started in London, uh, and it it was a very very huge. A company before being bought by Google. It was already a 400 people company in London with a lot of other research group. Um, small story about DeepMind and Google, which is the NHS. I think we can move a little bit to ethics. Uh, when DeepMind was a startup in England, um, they got access to the NHS database because the UK government says this is a the important local company, we need to promote them, we need to help them. And they got access to the, to the NHS. And they, the year after, they've been, they have been bought by Google. They moved to a lot of the research center, one in Montreal, one in California. Uh, they keep one in London too. And they kept one in London too. But then they start to make deal with the NHS to say, okay, we're going to sell you tools that we design with the database from your patient. A and then there have been big crises in the, in the community. Uh, and I don't know if some of you are from England or, uh, and on, on the journal, on the papers, uh, two years ago, there, there, was a, there was a lot of protest about that. You know, this has been paid, this exam, by taxpayer. That we give it to a private company, which is not in anymore England from, from UK, but American. And then we want to sell you the benefit and the economic benefit of that and keep all the IP. And the NHS had to move back. And, and they, they, they did a big uh, acknowledgement. They say, okay, we did a big mistake. And now we're gonna put a much more clear way of sharing the data with potentially non-profit uh, objective for our patients. Um, and other country, just to show you that France is not so good, uh, Germany uh, was not so good too. They put a lot of money last year, but they really uh, put the money. Um, uh, and now they are growing a lot. I'm now, uh, I'm working at the border of uh, Germany in Strasbourg, and I can tell you there is some kind of vacuum effect from Germany. Uh, because they are recruiting a lot in the field of AI. They put a, a lot of uh, a million euro in this field. France is supposed to do it now, uh, but it's, it's late, it's late in coming. Um, the last thing is, you have seen these three guys. Uh, they just got the Turing Prize uh, three weeks ago. Uh, Yann Lequin, a French guy that worked for long uh, in AIU. Uh, Jeffington in Toronto and, and Joseph Benjo in Montreal. A and th this is one of the area where this marketing, because there is a lot of marketing, a lot of hype too, huh? uh, in the deep learning uh, was born. And some of you may uh, read the story uh, about the uh, side meetings they organized in, in, the, in, the, in the Rockies uh, 
in 2010, I think, or something like that, where they invite all the people from the meeting where they were not supposed to do uh, a lecture uh, in a hotel, uh, 100 kilometers for that, uh, to do some kind of side meeting uh, and to create the event about uh, deep learning. Um, a lot of mis terminology misuse, of course, but that you probably know that better than me. Of course, AI is a very large and wide field and deep learning is just the narrow bound and uh, there is a lot of things uh, out of deep learning. And again, uh, I was working last week with people in, the, in research in the field and a lot of people now, they start to see the limitation of deep learning and they, for example, start to want to incorporate um, other uh, algorithm within the deep learning. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, at all, but for example, some Bayesian approach within the network uh, to increase the power of this network and to make them more efficient, because we're gonna see that these networks are very poorly efficient. And, and this is another view of all the different branch uh, of artificial intelligence, and we're gonna move forward. Okay, what's happened between and I'm sure you're going to have plenty of uh, very strong and scientific lecture about that. But why, what's happened between 1952, 56 and the beginning of neural network and 2010, which is the, some of the uh, hype moment. And, and this is probably going to have a lecture about the, the, the perceptron and, 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 and how, how it was built. Uh, two things and we discussed that uh, earlier, the more slow and, and uh, the computer power that uh, gives the possibility to do things that was not possible to, to, to be done in the past, and the data, uh, the explosion of data. Uh, and these new data that we collect now are not any more or less structural than they were proportionally a lot of data are completely unstructured data. And if you just, 10 years ago, we were even not thinking using unstructured data for doing statistics or epidemiology or, or research. Now, with these kind of tools, it's possible to use very poorly structured data. Of course, if you have better structured data, qualifies better, but it's not always necessary a and that's, the second reason why this deep learning is working, we have computer power and we have a lot of data. And both give the potentiality to go against the main limitation, which is the poor efficiency of this model. Because you have a lot of energy and you need a lot of energy to fill the engine uh, to, to get results. And the internet was really uh, the area where these tools were born because the data are not an issue. They have, is they have data by uh, billion or, and, and, and they have the computer power and, and they had the computer power before the other. Now it's possible to have the computer power relatively easily, but 10 years ago on 2008, only Google had all the computer uh, uh, localized to be able to do that. They, that's why they started before the other. They had the, both the data and the computer power. Now it starts to be a little bit different. We spoke about that, uh, that and we, I think we have the, the answer during the, 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 the wrong panel. I, I will just say that for me as a summary, AI definitely won't make job disappear, but will definitely make task disappear. And sometimes we switch completely. It's tough. It's tough when you have a job which is based on um, close collaboration teaching. When you're a physician, you learn for 20 years by being close to somebody that have a strong knowledge. And it takes a long period of learning curve. And then you have a system that change very quickly the whole uh, paradigm without so much control on experience. When a system is slow to change, we generally also have the capability to see 
what are the side effects, the bad things that happen. When it changes very fast, you can have very strong side effects and nobody sees it at the beginning and you see it too late. Too late. Healthcare sector. It's a perfect area for AI because we have a lot of data uh, from everywhere. Of course, the genomics, um, the medical diagnosis approach, which is currently just at the beginning. Osp other areas that you don't think about, hospital management. A lot of data, very well structured generally, uh, that are available for, for AI. The drug discovery process, I will say that in, in the healthcare system, that's probably the big pharma that have invested the, the most in the AI field. Um, why? Since it's very expensive to make a clinical trial to validate a drug, uh, and it's minimum 10 million of, and sometimes 15 to 20 million euro for one oncology drug, just for doing the clinical trial and to go to the phase three market. Now, these drugs are so competitive that the gap in, um, in progress and improvement between the old drugs are very little, very small. That means it costs even more to develop the drug because you have to prove the difference with the gold's current gold standard. What they want, the, the big pharma, they want us to make a patient certification. They want us to, with blood tests and medical imaging, non-invasive tests, to be able to separate the population in the one that will respond potentially well to the treatment, to the, one, to the group that will not be a good responder. By doing that, they want to do what they call a companion diagnostic test. That means they're going to sell a drug with a diagnostic test to select correctly the patient to this drug. Of course, they will touch only a, a subgroup of the population, but at least they will be able, able to prove the superiority. Now, they are stuck. There are a lot of difficulty to prove the superiority of the drug, except then there is a big discovery. Uh, and and that, that's the reason the I was uh, two months ago in uh, the uh, Rhin Valley in Baal, uh, where you have Novartis and Roche, and they have digitalized everything. And, and, but they don't have the knowledge yet to use the data, but everything is ready, and all the old clinical trials are digitalized and ready to be uh, analyzed with, uh, as smart tools. Of course, and, and this is a topic globally uh, of my talk and globally of this week, I think, uh, what about medical imaging? First of all, medical imaging is much more than radiology. And, and that is something that people forget. Uh, and even radiology is not only radiologists. Radiology now, and there is a very active field in AI in radiology, is uh, radiation therapy. V very interesting and active field. Also, and this is my research field now, image target therapy. That means to what, everything which is non-invasive uh, could be done with eye view, could be done with needle but you need a very precise targeting of the lesion to, to treat the lesion. Or the pathology, that works so well. A deep learning works so well in pathology for a simple reason. Currently, pathologists don't watch the slide. We know that the pathologists, when they do, uh, for example, a very a surgeon do a, a large a resection of lymph node with 20 lymph nodes, the number of slides, volume of tissue, which is currently examined and reviewed by the pathologist is less than 10%. Just because they don't have time. It's too time consuming. It will take a, a day to review all the nodes slide by slide. And they, there was plenty of paper that just demonstrate that AI, if you prepare all the slides and, and the computer read it, of course, it do an extensive job, and even if its performance for each slide is not better, at the end it's much better in depiction. And having the computer that do the depiction of the pathology reading and the pathologist, secondly, that look at the target that were targeted by the system and to do, for example, the final grading and stuff like that, 
is something that is very, very efficient. Dermatology, you have all seen, there is currently, they are not FDA approved, it's not so clear, but there are a lot of tools, small camera, just to give an evaluation of the type of nevus and potential for mal malignant melanoma uh, with go go very good result. And, and now they are in the process of uh, an, a large approval. Ophthalmology, we spoke about it. And endoscopy, I, I, I showed you a case. Um, that is a field that a lot of the teachers that are here uh, knows very well that for years, image vision was done without deep learning, and, and there was good result, not enough all, most of the time. And, and, and one of the approach was the atlas based approach, and it was already at the end using uh, some kind of neural network like autoencoder uh, to create the multi atlas and to compare that uh, to the pathology, and that was an approach. What we're going to speak about is really uh, the, the neural network. I, I'm just going to go very quick on that because you're probably much more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, just to stop on this one, uh, you, this one is very important. You can teach a network with a database and you can always get very strong results. Uh, the overfitting is easy. If you overtrain the system, you're always going to get very good result on this specific database. But when you're going to move that to another one, it's not going to work. That's why now one of the standard is to use at least two databases, one to train the system and one to test it. Uh, and of course, one of the game is to do not overtrain because normally when you train the system on the one database, you have to lock your system in your database and test it on the validation one, and if you have, if you don't have a good result, you're supposed to destroy your your process, and you are not allowed to restart because if you restart one thousand times, at the end you're going to find a good combination. Uh, that's, and I'm not sure everybody is doing that. Uh, maybe we can discuss of that uh, later. Um, we, we spoke about that. Just to give you uh, this, uh, you all know this kind of image, which are done from video, and, and these are the base uh, of what is done in medical imaging and in a lot of circumstances. Uh, this not only, and that's what we dream as a radiologist, to when we screen on the CT, to have the target and the probability of a disease uh, on, on, right on, on the image uh, and to say uh, there is a nodule on the lung, probability of cancer 95%. Okay? You do the depiction, the characterization and eventually uh, the evaluation of the... And globally, when you have a good population to train your system, uh, you can do it. Uh, I'm just going to move here. And that's the video I showed you on the, on the brand table. This using exactly the same neural network that the one that are used uh, for video uh, for Uber car with the accident we know. Uh, and uh, you can depict very well uh, this flat poly. This is not so easy to do for, for an endoscopist because he has to do some maneuver, he has to do plenty of things at the same time. And then eventually you can do some more advanced characterization which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it works when you have a very specific disease, in this case TB, tuberculosis, and a good data site, a good outcome of the patient, and you train the system, especially in 2D, which is the uh, easiest way to, to do that, uh, it works. And, and the performance of uh, a, a well-trained, uh, very basic neural network, 2D neural network like that, is close to the one of experts radiologist on this specific disease. Uh, what we don't know if what's going to happen if we have a, uh, we have trained the system for TB and we have a um, rib metastasis. The system will definitely not pick it up, and, and that's make the things more complicated. 
Another example where we, we are going to see some FDA, uh, there, I know there is FDA uh, cur currently in process about uh, uh, breast screening. Uh, the, the breast screening reading, which is 2D again, which make it easier again, like I said, uh, works at the s almost the same level than uh, uh, breast imager uh, expert. The 97% AUC, um, and, and these are the result for the the American uh, challenge two years ago, 2017. I, th I think it was that they, they won the second prize. The first prize was a French company, a TerraPixel, uh, and uh, uh, but it works now. It's just a question of regulatory approval. Uh, knowing that, how are we going to use that? Are we going to use that as a first reader, as a second reader, to check the radiologist, to do triage? No, nobody knows exactly how we're going to apply. And the problem is that the technical solution that has been developed in the field, non-medical field, where there is a lot of data, a lot of label data, if you want to differentiate a cat from a dog. You, are, you can go on the internet, you have ton of data of guy on Facebook that say my cat or my dog and you have a lot of trained data. Uh, but in, in the field of medical imaging and the field of healthcare globally, it's much more complicated. If the idea is to say we want to see an anatomy where an expert can say yes, this is the liver, yes, this is the uh, central uh, thalamus. That we can have a good uh, label data and a, a good uh, gold standard. But when you want to evaluate an outcome of the patient, what this patient became? Um, is it because what I found in the eyes can be uh, a bad prognostic for one disease? It's much more complicated because generally we don't have the evolution of this patient. And we don't have, at least we don't have it for free. It's very, it's very expensive to get it. Uh, okay? and, and this is one of the difficulty in the healthcare sector. Of course, the privacy, we discussed it previously, and, and the access to data and the legal uh, access. Okay, that's come just allow me to go to one of the limitations of this classical uh, neural network, is that they are very, very inefficient. That means the energy you need to fill the engine is huge. And you really need, need a, a, a gold mine of data uh, with, with a lot of loss of energy. And th there is an analogy that I like to do. In the, the first team engine, was invented in 18 something like 12. Uh, but at the beginning for almost 50 years, it was only used in the coal mine to pump the water because the need of coal was so huge that it was impossible to use it in other uh, circumstances. And it's only in 1872 that James Watts modified completely the system and make it very efficient in terms of energy that we were able to do the train and all the, uh, the beginning of the uh, revolution, industrial revolution. And I will say that at this moment, I, go, I hope it's going to go faster than that. I will say that at this moment, we are at the beginning of the engine steam, uh, very inefficient, and all the research lab currently work on the efficiency of this network to try to make them more efficient, more explainable, don't need so much data, the system that will be very, very smart is the one that will be able to train on a small amount of data. Like a human, we train, as a radiologist, I train on a small amount of data. If I'm an expert in liver, maybe in my life I've seen, I don't know, 2,000 uh, uh, this type of tumor of the liver. But when I see one, I know that I will recognize it. Uh, my efficiency in training is much better because I can adapt in different situations. And, and that I think is the next challenge, and this is not mine. 
Um, and and uh, um, also, and that's what I tried to see the efficiency, I tried to put there on, on this three curve, it's the old system, we were able to train them very fast with a limitation, a ceiling in performance. With the neural network, you can go very high, but you need a lot of data. Second limitation, to my eyes, are the lack of generalization. Um, once trained to a very specific task, that's a story of the uh, diabetic retinopathy and the melanoma, the system is not trained for something else. That means we need to anticipate, we need to accumulate either a different system together, uh, after one after the other, uh, to try to cover a large spectrum of disease of the system when we want to apply it in real life, or at least to say, okay, we're going to apply it to this approach, but don't forget, we're going to miss that. This is not done for that. Lack of explainability, I think we had this discussion. Uh, we were not completely in agreement about that. I, I think it's quite important to be able to explain, especially in a, to be able to explain and to be concordant to what we know from biology, biophysics, and human body. Um, the medical field and history is, is more than 12th century. Um, we accumulate a lot, lot of experience. I, when I say we, it's the, the world about healthcare. It's, it's so bad to lose everything because we are agnostic of this past. And, um, and I, I, I always been surprised when I, uh, when I've been contacted in 2012 by the team of uh, the Mila group, uh, they wanted to get information on data that I knew they cannot get it because I, I'm a physician, I, knew the, I know the biology, I know that, okay, you can eventually get some data on the lung tumor without contrast injection because there is some natural contrast between the tumor and the lung, but not on the liver nodule without contrast injection because there is no natural contrast on CT. And the, the first question they asked me, okay, we did that, uh, with Harvard on the GFR group uh, uh, to, to characterize some type of tumor of the lung. We want to do that on the liver. Give me all your CT without contrast of the... I said, but it's not going to work. It's just a question of knowledge about the physiology and to adjust the knowledge uh, and to do exactly... to do only what's... Is there some signal in the image on the, on the information that can be used. If there is no signal, there is no data. A and sometimes the people think there is signal everywhere. I don't think there is signal everywhere. There is area, there is no signal, at least pertinent signal on what we want to see. And that's uh, again. Um, this is a nice slide. This is from the MIT. Um, it, it's um, it's been, it was published last year, and it's, it's just to explain to the community and to the scientist community to be careful about AI and uh, that we can say or make the system say everything we want by training with different databases. Uh, they call that AI the uh, uh, psychopath AI, Norman the psychopath AI. And they train the system to, uh, with a 2D neural network, very basic, to read the Rorschach test, the, the, the ink blot test. And they train it with uh, a group of training database from a normal medical center uh, with a lot of uh, representative tests and the description of this test on, on writing and then they enter that in the system. And on this image, for example, and you have a lot of bunch of examples, but it's very funny. Uh, you have on this ink blot, uh, the normal, normally trained AR with a normal population is a person is holding a, an umbrella in the air. And then they went to the dark web and they download plenty of image with all the caption of the image and they train the system with a dark web data set. A and with the same network, but another training database, uh, the system say the image is shot dead in front, uh, interpreting the same image, which is completely normal. For us, it's clear. But it was really to demonstrate the impact that 
that network is only a small part of the system. The way it's trained, uh, which, what the data you use to train it is sometimes much more important, okay? And, and, um, and that implies very two ba basic things that we know in, in medical field from years that, and it's very, very, it's m even more important in, in uh, AI deep learning, that the principle of this training implies that the tested data should have the same distribution than the training data, the trained data. If you have a change in distribution, you're gonna have some dif discrepancy, which is quite important because it's, it, for me, it's a physic philosophical issue. Just imagine currently the Chinese, and we discussed a little bit that, they have a, a big access to data. That means they're gonna be able to create tools very quickly. Um, these data, all these data will be available to another type of population, I will say um, phenotype, white, uh, uh, bigger, I don't know. Other type of uh, medical healthcare system, that means economy or capacity to treat patients. We don't treat the patient the same way in China than in France or in, in America. That means to be able to have a good system, it should be at least retrained using this process of uh, uh, advanced learning with a database where the, the test will be used. And uh, it's not true for everything, but if we really want to go on the medical outcome, I think it's completely true. And I just want to and, and this is on the same sentences, which is a reverse. Uh, the system will have exactly the same bias as there, there is bias in the data to train it. Um, this is true f in every field of healthcare. This is not AI at all. This is a study we, we, we done last year. Uh, there is no AI. It's just about the appropriateness. and the, the per Every test in the medical field every um, exam is test, is generally test in a population where there is a lot of disease. Uh, for example, 20 to 40% of the patient population have the disease. We know that. And we know also that every test has this imitation in performance. Here it's a CT pulmonarium, CT angio scanner uh, for pulmonary embolism and we know it's probably more, it's, it's, it's 95 and 95, but doesn't matter, it's for the benefits of this explanation. Uh, that if you have this 30% uh, incidence, prevalence of the disease uh, on the population, you're gonna be able to depict, this is a table on the upside, uh, with 100% patient tested, you're gonna be able to detect 27 positive. Only three will be missed, and only seven will be false positive, which is acceptable. When you're gonna use this same test in another population where there is only 10% disease, you're gonna have the same 27 true positive, but you're gonna create 27 false positive. That means 27 patients will be treated for a disease they don't have, with a drug which is potentially very dangerous, anticoagulation, blood thinner, with a potential brain hemorrhage and complication. This is today, and this is medical practice for years. That means we know that, we know and we, we try to avoid it, not always. In, a, in deep learning is even worse because we, here at least we understand what's happened. In deep learning when these kind of things happen, we even don't know why, which is a little bit more complicated. And this is also, uh, something that we have to, to take in account. Okay, I'm gonna move to that. Um, yeah, a lot of bad comments have been published over the last two, three years by the medical community about moving from the uh, hypothesis driven, which is or expertise or field or knowledge to the data driven uh, hypothesis. On my point, I think it's a very good point because 
I think it's the most interesting um, benefit of AI is to give hypothesis that the human knowledge or brain didn't catch up, catch up. Uh, and, to, and to try to have new hypothesis and eventually to validate this hypothesis in a second step. Okay, I'm going to move that. Um, what I know, and that's something we, we wrote recently, uh, when we want to move from techniques and to go to a clinical transfer, there is a very, very uh, rigorous uh, pipeline. We need, with the AI or without, you, we need to have an hypothesis generation. We cannot apply a, a network in a database and say, well, you're going to see what's happened. No, we need to apply to a specific question. Initially, a clinical question. It could be an anatomical question, it could be segmentation, but if we move to clinical, it has to be a clinical hypothesis. Is this patient as a disease? Is it a severe disease? I don't know. We need to be able to do the replication uh, to repeat what we have found in our research lab, in other research lab or in other data population, uh, in other data, data set. Then we need to, to prototype how we're going to put that system in practice. And ideally, we, that's where I was speaking about prospective evaluation to put the system in real life and to see how it's going to change the, the way the physician work. I'm going to give you an example which happened in Karolinska, uh, not far away, uh, not long away. Um, they designed in their lab a very nice tool, now it's, I think it's commercially available somewhere, to depict bone fractures. Um, it was working well, 95% to depict bone fractures. And it was working so well that the uh, physician started to put it in practice, in use at the MR during night. And the radiologists that were so busy with tone of case reading, without saying anything to anybody, to the administration of the hospital, to the, started to do not read the one that were not selected as positive by the system. And of course, what's happened is one day, of course, a big spine fracture was missed, and everybody said, oh, but what's happened? We were doing that. Yeah, but we were overload of work, and that was the only way to do it. If not, we were not reading it. But maybe it's better not reading it. Maybe it's better not reading it, because if you don't read it, you don't give a false information. At least, you give no information. No, it's just... Um, Document efficacy under clinical trial condition, that's to go for uh, 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 level three uh, FDA pr approval and effectiveness. Okay, application to imaging, we, we spoke about it. I think I'm gonna close because everybody's sleeping. Um, <laughs> um, detection, detection is, um, we, we saw that in the, in the street, that's the same process. It's not so easy because to detect something, we have to qualify the disease. Is there a disease or not? Uh, segmentation is easier. Segmentation, and we spoke about it, because to know on the medical imaging that is a liver, okay, I think globally every radiologist that is normally trained will say that is a liver. That means the gold standard is easy to get. And that's why it's working well. And uh, we all have in your lab very good tools for segmentation. Registration works very well. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very strong application of AI uh, to register two types of imaging or to real-time imaging. Uh, this is something that we I learned we do in my new group. Uh, it's for example, we have some very uh, super nice uh, 3D imaging uh, on CT done before surgery. And we are using MRI for uh, advanced interventional uh, radiology uh, techniques. And, and of course, what we see, oops, maybe I'm gonna come back, yeah. It, everything is moving. When we're in real life, everything is moving. The quality of MRI is very poor. But we use a few slides and a few uh, frame because the, uh, the, 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 
the frequency is not so high. To register uh, with the 3D image uh, from the previous uh, surgery, from the test that is done previous surgery. And these kind of things, we were doing it before without deep learning, and it works much better with deep learning now. Uh, and this is something that uh, we, we're going we, to implement soon. Okay, what are the applications? I think I'm going to very, go very quick. Um, patient classification to separate normal from pathology. The problem is to get the real uh, definition of what is a pathology. It's not always easy. Let's say you have a nodule of 5 millimeter in the lung. Uh, is it benign or malignant? Most of the time you have to wait two years or 18 months to be sure that this nodule has grown to say this is malignant. And just imagine if you go retrospectively, and I have done that in my group at McGill, we went to 10,000 lung, uh, city of the lung with nodule. And then we just did a, a selection process very manually, very painful, to see how much do we have with a good follow-up to train our system. And we got only 800. 800 where the quality, uh, the time frame was enough clear to be able to train the system. And that's all day, uh, pra pra day practice, I think you. This is really our, what's happened when we work retrospectively. Another possibility is to do, when you have a disease, especially oncology, to try to, class, to do a classification of the disease. Is it severe, advanced? And that's something that the system will probably uh, be able to do by reproducing what the human was doing. Maybe it's not so interesting. Maybe the human classification we done for years, the only one we had access was not the most interesting, and the system will give us new hypotheses to create new classification that currently do not exist. I, I spoke already about patient stratification. This is a very simple summary of that. If you are able to take a population of, I don't know, uh, liver cancer or brain cancer and segment in a group uh, all the ones that have uh, in the same line, the same type of disease that will respond on the same on the treatment, patients will benefit of it a lot because you, you won't give them treatment for nothing and you're going to only give the treatment to the good one. That's what we call demorphinotyping. I'm going to go fast on that. Just to also give you something, that, that I think it's important, this slide. I, uh, it's to say for years, as a radiologist and a scientist in the field of medical imaging, when we try to create biomarkers, a way to quantify the disease, we have this first approach. That means to be more and more specific to biology. Create very, very complicated uh, signal, measurement, tracer, to be close to the biology and to try to measure the biology. Very smart, most of the time. One of the limitations is you, we've never been able to reproduce that because one group is doing one techniques and it's so difficult to reproduce that it's quite impossible to transfer that to another group, even in the academic group. Just imagine when you move out the academic center. This is quite interesting. A lot of signal, but poor reproducibility. Now with the deep learning, we can try to say, well, Maybe let's go back to the basic standard image where we think there is not so much signal, but we need to get some signal anyway, and try to analyze, analyze better this signal and to quantify better this signal. These two are not opposite. Huh? You can mix them. But it, when you mix, you have a problem of data sets on the, if you have a very too complicated technique, it's very complicated to get the data set. And the way to do that, to try to quantify, there is a, the classical way where we, the feature were created by human and what we call, um, I don't know, radiomics if we want, 
uh, and we were doing segmentation, some kind of human design features, and validate a lot of data to try to see if there is a correlation between the data and, and the outcome. And now we try to use deep learning to do that, which is not so easy because also of the um, issue of explainability. In this case, I think explainability is very important. We want to understand why this drug is going to work. Because if we understand it, we're going to be able to make the link between biology and imaging and to, to understand the complete process. Um, I'm going to just move that. Um, and, and that is uh, the global uh, approach for radiomics and uh, uh, always standardization, which is the most complicated, and, and, and pre-processing of the image when they are not the same to try to make them at least a little bit equivalent, and then different process. And at one point we lock when we have learned, we lock the system and we test it in another population. And only at this level we can say potentially we have a biomarker. Okay, and that's what I said about uh, th this approach that the, some people in my group are doing. Uh, uh, it's to try to split the neural network in different levels. For example, to learn the segmentation and the tumor position and to train the system only on this area and not on everywhere. That, and to split in different phase uh, the evaluation of the image and not analyzing the whole image, for example, for a tumor that is two centimeters. And, and we can go further on that to evaluate, for example, the inner part or uh, the peripheral part of the tumor or the adjacent organs. And everything has different information in it. And that potentially give a little bit of explainability. And also, we need less data for doing that because you can train the basic one of the lab data set because it's not so difficult to get plenty of liver segmented and tumor. We don't need very strong gold standard for that. But to know if this tumor is going to respond to a treatment, it's going to be much more difficult to get a large data set. And if we have transferred the weight from the first one and, and, the, uh, and the parameter, the system will be more close uh, to, to be ready to, to, to work. Another application that's going to work very fast is the tumor uh, follow-up measurement. We spoke about it. We, we, know we, we know to do segmentation. We know to do measurement. We, know, we, we will know soon how to do a good registration uh, in different situations. That in, based on that, we'll be able to do automatic quantification on the tumor grow or response to treatment. This is a pain for radiologists. It takes a lot of time to us. If it can be done by computer, I will be very happy of it. Huh? And that goes to a white paper we have published uh, uh, in Canada uh, and, and with, with a different hypothesis of, for medical imaging where we can place AI. Um, the exi existing situation is on the left. We have patient, an imaging place, a radiologist. I read it. You have a disease. You don't have the disease. I'm wrong. I'm right. doesn't matter. Um, you have another possibility to use AI as a triage. Uh, you do the imaging tests, and then only the case that will be, say, that potentially positive will be read by the radiologist, for example. And if we do that, we're going to set up the system to be very, very sensitive, not missing case, even if we overread. Okay? Replacement, we just say, let's remove a radiologist or physician and do only comp that's happened now it's happened uh, with the uh, ophthalmic um, retin retin uh, automatic in in, um, in India they launch Google launch a process of using these tools to do screening for uh, ret diabetic retinopathy using only AI and the only the patient with the disease, or potentially the disease, are sent uh, to a lab and, and to an hospital to be, uh, to be checked. And that, that is in place where there is no physician that is better than nothing, anyway. Uh, and add-on is to say, okay, 
I'm a radiologist, I'm going to do my reading, but I'm going to check double with an AI to see if I didn't miss anything. Uh, every scenario is possible and will, it's a case scenario, it will depend on the case. And I'm going to finish there. Um, why is it going to work? <laughs> because I, I looked, I'm negative, but I, I don't, I'm not. Huh? I'm very positive. I just want to uh, avoid a lot of mistakes. Um, digital imaging reading, it, it will be much more powerful than human because of the speed, because of the cost, because of the uh, reproducibility when the system is trained. Um, currently, all else that are recorded are digitalized. A and this is a base to, for this tool to be used. Um, deep learning can adapt to intelligence data, which is new in this field. Uh, I, I love a lot, and I've already, the, the hypothesis generation of deep learning, and I already learned from deep learning uh, in, in the recent research we have done with my group in liver tumor, we've picked up an ID that we applied and we check on biology that we didn't, definitely nobody has thought about it without the computer to show it, uh, show it to us. And a lot of open source, which is good. And, and one of the limitations will be the fight between scientists, open source, and business. And there is place for everybody, and, and there is need for everybody. Uh, but we have to be careful of a too business-oriented process where it's, it's not always for good uh, and for the, the benefit of the healthcare. It's just for the benefits of the uh, venture capital that I'm investing in. Huh? Question, uh, how to validate these tools? We, we, I think we discussed it a little bit. Uh, who control AI and who is responsible for its action? Big question. Uh, you remember the Uber car accident? The, this uh, bicycle uh, rider that has been killed by a car. Who is responsible for that? It's, it's a big challenge because you're going to put the company that creates these tools responsible, at least co-responsible with the physician of the tools, which is a big, big challenge. Currently, all these tools were on level, low level on the approval and the radiologist was just using it. Okay, he's doing my segmentation, I validate. But at one point, it's not enough. We need to move the next step. How to generalize AI across demographics, region, healthcare system, we spoke about it. How to ensure privacy of the data and social acceptability. This is a very important issue. I will organize a workshop and a seminar in, in, with the European Parliament in Strasbourg soon uh, about that. Because if the population, the patient, are not involved in their, and don't know exactly what we do with the data, uh, there are going to be some rejection, like there is a rejection on Facebook. But, but it's much more important than Facebook. I think. Um, application of AI to clinical practice, we don't know yet how we're going to implement that in clinical practice in the workflow. Um, how to assess the quality, the reproductive training data. Nobody has a real process. We try to create, the, the FDA has been very open right now. The FDA was known to be very uh, close to new innovation and because there is so many so much business in US with AI, they have done a fast track process and they are very open to innovation, which is new, but they discover by walking. And everybody is discovering how to do that and we're gonna have some mistake. We're gonna have the Uber car, for sure. But that's part of uh, progress and technology. And uh, now uh, is this technology is entering the mainstream of clinical medicine. We spoke about five years. I think it's going to be even before. Um, and that's it. And, and this is, uh, yeah. Don't re do not forget that, yes, the good physician, that's Osler, William Osler said, the good physician treats the disease. The uh, great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And that, no computer will never do it. Thank you.
<laughs> I hope it's not too late. A little bit sorry for that. Any question from the audience? Yep. Oh, moi j'ai un micro, ça va. De, un, deux. Okay, thank you for the very inspiring talk. Um, you mentioned uh, AlphaGo as an example, which a very good example, but you, we could have also mentioned uh, AlphaZero uh, for chess. Yeah, yeah. And um, what I think is more interesting than the fact that they, they managed to beat human, uh, the AI managed to beat human, is the fact that because it was using reinforcement learning, um, the algorithm learned by itself, and it really uh, completely changed how we see chess. It came up with new strategies that were not known, uh, even by, by grandmasters, and, um, and now humans are learning from AI. Mm -hmm. um, do you think this is something that would be possible in the, in the medical uh, field? It's close, to the, it's close to the hypothesis generation that I yeah, already mentioned. Yeah, I think mentioned. so, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, don't forget that biology is quite complex. A and um, I understand chess is complex, there is multiple situations, but less than biology. A and um, the dispersion in biology is huge. And when you do one measurement in a group of population, it's huge dispersion. This is a, a field where the dispersion of signal is really huge. And that make the dispersion of a chess base C to DC is not so huge. Uh, I, I think it's a big difference. And that will happen, of course. Hypothesis generation that help to understand. Uh, yes. More complicated, of course, because of the, uh, the multiple uh, input. Very intuitive response. Huh? I have no data to... <laughs> Uh, thank you for your speech, first of all. I was very interested in what you said about the about, uh, adaptability of AI. And I, I was thinking, but probably some, someone already had uh, that strange idea, why don't they train the AI not only to look for disease, but to look for no disease? And yeah. they, they just show a lot of, of uh, you know, healthy patients and all the kind of disease you can think of for a liver, whatever organs you, you thinking of, and then you're training for new disease instead of yeah. a particular disease. Uh, some people do that. Some people do that in, in the triage system, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are some, some stuff are designed to try to make the higher probability that there is no lung TB or bone fracture, stuff like that. You d it's just a way to set up the balance between the, uh, the false positive and the false negative. Uh, just, uh, but if you want to do that, it's a clinical hypothesis. You say, my, I, want to demonst I want to check all the patients that have nothing, because it's quite important for me to know that. You organize your system to do it. Uh, it's already done in a lot of circumstances, especially lung, for example, uh, plain film of the lung. Yeah. 